to AL. And now uh, in these hard times, we have the just started AL webinar projects. And the last month, it was the first one given by the Juan Garcia Velasco from the Spain. It was the really good one. Now, the second one will be about adenomyosis. Our guest speaker tonight is the, actually not the guest speaker, host speaker, and uh, uh, Harold Crandall. He is from the Germany. He is the now general secretary of the EL uh, more than one year. We are working together very close. Actually, uh, he is basically, actually, essentially gynecologic oncologist, and he is minimal invasive surgeon, and he is the endometrial specialist. And uh, last few years, he is work working about the adenomyosis. That's why he will speak about the, what is the new one. I mean, the diagnosis and therapy for the adenomyosis. Please, Dr. Karando. Thank you so much, Engin. Um, sorry again for the delay. Um, there were some technical problems, but I think now everything is okay. Everybody can hear me. Um, I'm very happy uh, and honored to uh, do the webinar today. Uh, Mr. President, Engin Oral, that was your idea. It was a very good idea. And actually, it's a good, um, uh, good thing to meet each other online, even in these times when we cannot uh, be together at the normal congresses. Um, today, my topic is um, what is new in diagnosis and therapy in adenomyosis in 2020. And um, I thought maybe we should start uh, with what is old, or better to say, what is the status quo in uh, adenomyosis. Some years ago, the adenomyosis was not uh, up to date as it is today. Now it's on vogue, but just some years ago, nobody was talking about adenomyosis. So I think the, the actual status and what maybe we presented uh, 2019 in December in the Prague Congress uh, is still something that should be interesting for everybody. So we will start uh, with, the, with the old uh, details and then we will go to the 2020 uh, publications and the news. Why is it important to diagnose adenomyosis? Um, because of its high incidence, although it's still unclear how high it is, uh, because it is the central reproductive organ and uh, because most of the patients with adenomyosis have symptoms. It is also important because it has a negative impact on fertility and uh, causes a reduced pregnancy rate and a reduced birth rate. It may also cause a higher abortion rate. And there are a lot of publications in the literature that show that. It is also important to diagnose adenomyosis because there uh, is a higher risk for obstetrical complications, as we know, since some years. For example, for premature birth, for the premature rupture of membranes, for uterine rupture, and uh, even for fetal outcome. This is a nice review from 2016, and the, I like the title because it says adenomyosis, what the patient needs. And uh, this is something that I would like to continue, saying that the first thing that the patient needs is a good diagnostic, diagnostic step-by-step, -step, always considering adenomyosis in all our patients with endometriosis. We published this review and uh, we found out that it's always a combination of an anamnesis symptoms, of clinical symptoms, of the gynecological examination, the ultrasound, and maybe MRI, hysteroscopy, or laparoscopy when you want to find out if there is adenomyosis or not. Most of the patients have symptoms. In this publication, the author says that only less than 5% have no symptoms. The classical symptoms are dysmenorrhea, bleeding disorders, dyspareunia, and pelvic pain. So if you talk to your patient, this might give you the first hint. And then, of course, uh, there can also be the problem of persistence of symptoms after laparoscopic resection of peritoneal or deep infiltrating endometriosis, which can be a typical sign of adenomyosis as it remains untreated. In the gynecological examination, <clears throat> you can 
sometimes find painful uterus, a central pain, central pelvic pain, uh, the uterine size can be enlarged, the uterine mobility can be changed, maybe minor mobility because of um, simultaneous deep endometriosis, as we know that um, the probability of adenomyosis is almost 50% in case of deep endo. And then comes ultrasound, which is maybe the most important tool. And since some years, we learned so much about ultrasound diagnostics in endometriosis. And in 2015, Graciano and his group published uh, this very nice pictorial review. And he said 2D and 3D transvaginal ultrasound offers diagnostic signs which are easy to detect by every gynecologist. This is uh, maybe a little bit too optimistic, uh, but in a way it's true. And there's one publication from last year uh, which compared uh, the detection rate uh, of adenomyosis by radiologists doing ultrasound or experienced gin sonologists. And the result is that we are better. So maybe Graciano was right in his review. The typical signs are myometrial cysts, subendometrial microcysts, question mark sign, heterogeneous myometry, hyperechoic myometrial lesions, subendometrial thickening <clears throat> in the junctional zone, subendometrial linear striae, and the uterine enlargement. Those signs are <clears throat> relevant and can be found in a lot of publications. The problem is that the reliability of these ultrasound signs remains still unclear. So we do not know exactly which signs are uh, better than the others, and there's no score so far. In one of the last reviews from two years ago, the pool sensitivity and specificity for 2D transvaginal ultrasound was 83 and 64% in a 10-year meta-analysis. You can also use 3D ultrasound, and this is something that maybe Katerina can show us uh, in one of the next webinars because she's the EL expert for ultrasound diagnostics. But 3D is very special, and not everybody has 3D systems in, uh, in, in the uh, daily practice, so I think we should concentrate on 2D. Here are some examples. As you can see here, the uterus, with a small subendometrial microcyst. This, this is a typical sign with a white lining of the adenomyotic cystic wall. This is a picture with a sign of asymmetry and question mark sign caused by the asymmetry. This is a uterus with a small um, hyperechoic spot in the posterior wall and a small cyst. Here is a uterus with an IUD and just in the posterior wall, you can see a small microcyst, and this is a typical sign, and it's almost pathognomonic, I would say. When you can see this, it's for sure adenomyosis. But remember that these findings are cyclic, so sometimes in a patient you may find a cyst, and some days later you may not find it again, uh, because it's a cyclic um, cystic lesion. Here's another very small cyst, it's almost invisible, two to three millimeters. And here's another example. These are the striae caused by the um, very different uh, tissue. And this is a typical finding too. This is another example. It's a 42 year old patient with dysmenorrhea, bleeding disorders. And it's a typical uh, adenomyotic uterus with a lot of cysts and hyperechoic spots. And the therapy in this case was an LNG IUD. The op uh, alternative option would have been a hysterectomy. If you're sure if it's a cyst or uh, maybe a vessel, you can just use the Doppler ultrasound. And uh, when you can find no flow, then for sure it's a um, cystic lesion. Another option is the MRI, which is sometimes used uh, in adenomyosis with, with, with very good results, but of course it's very cost uh, uh, intense. Um, so we have some experience, but not too much experience. 
Um, so far, the junctional zone maximum was about 12 millimeters. Now there's a new publication from last year which says uh, that maybe the junctional zone thickness is not so important, but the junctional zone irregularity. And I think this is something that we can see very well in this picture. Um, here is another example, which is a combination of adenomyosis and deep infiltrating endometriosis, a large uh, retrocervical um, uh, deep endo with infiltration of the rectum with a mushroom cap, and it's very, um, uh, very uh, sure that here it might be also an adenomyosis case. Um, another diagnostic tool which can be very helpful is hysteroscopy in these cases. It uh, allows you the inspection of the uterine cavity um, <clears throat> and the inspection of the endometrial layer. Typical findings in hysteroscopy are irregular endometrium with tiny openings on the endometrial surface, uh, a hypervascularization, the strawberry pattern, fibrocystic appearance or hemorrhagic cystic legions. Here, for example, you can see an endometrial opening. Um, so to summarize, using this uh, review from Andres from 2018, uh, the non-invasive uh, methods by symptoms, transvaginal ultrasound, and maybe MRI. Uh, but then we are still not sure if it's really adenomyosis or not. Sometimes we have cases that we think it's quite sure that it's adenomyosis and after hysterectomy, for example, it's just uh, diffuse leiomyomatosis or something different, but not adenomyosis. So it might be helpful to use invasive diagnostics, uh, tissue sampling, and there are some options by laparoscopic needle biopsy, transvaginal needle biopsy, or hysteroscopic biopsy. The problem is um, that uh, <clears throat> The question if we need a histo histological proof, I think it could be helpful uh, for the safety of the diagnosis and the consequences, maybe for the therapeutic costs, uh, maybe because we change our reproductive treatment, maybe we change our surgical treatment, and maybe uh, it explains why um, dysmenorrhea remains after laparoscopic resection. There are some publications about uh, biopsy techniques, for example. Uh, here is one from uh, the group from Tellum, uh, uh, but as you can see, the results are not so uh, good, uh, and maybe the transvaginal core biopsy is not the right tool. Um, <clears throat> here's a uh, Cochrane review uh, with almost 2,000 patients, and you can see that uh, the sensitivity and specificity uh, vary a lot between the different uh, techniques. Some are better, some are not so good, but there are some mm, lights uh, at the end of the tunnel and maybe uh, there are some options how to um, obtain a good uh, biopsy in patients where we think that adenomyosis could play a role in infertility or pain. This is uh, just an example from our hospital. Um, in young patients, we use the mini resectoscope, which is five millimeters. And as you can see, we enter without dilatation. So there's the native cavity, no bleeding, no lesions by uh, dilatation. Uh, we do not measure the length of the uh, cavity. And then uh, with this very, very small bipolar loop, you can obtain uh, one uh, biopsy with the endometrial layer and uh, maybe the first parts of junctional zone and then it's important that you just go down and take the next layer from the myometrium and I think it's important that you explain this to your pathologist in order to make them clear what you are doing and then maybe they can understand uh, the idea. Uh, in this publication from 2015 the specificity uh, of transvaginal ultrasound in combination with hysteroscopic biopsy was almost 90%, which shows that it can be a good uh, tool in combination. However, in our own results, which are still not published, we, we found a lot of 
uh, false negative cases, and we found an observer bias, a path pathologist bias, uh, and another problem which um, is uh, regarding the tubal perturbation, uh, because when you open uh, the wall of the cavity, then the normal uh, uh, tubal perturbation test cannot be done anymore because the uh, blue dye goes into the uterine wall. So at the end, when we finished our uh, <clears throat> diagnosis uh, and we have uh, to say clearly, okay, it's adenomyosis, then the question is, and now uh, how can we treat adenomyosis and what should we do? Um, the treatment options are medical treatment, surgical treatment, reproductive treatment, and the treatment factors are symptoms, the family planning, completed or not completed, deep endo simultaneously, and patient's age. <clears throat> the possible approaches for patients with ongoing family planning are we do not do no surgery, no medication, and just send the patient to uh, reproductive treatment or uh, for spontaneous pregnancy. The other option is no surgery, but a certain type of medication and then reproductive treatment, or the combination of all our options, or just surgery, then reproductive treatment without any medication. Which way to go? The data shows that treatment of adenomyosis has a positive effect on fertility outcome. Well, so far, so good. Um, <clears throat> These are two reviews for all the medical treatment options, and they both are really interesting and very complete. The 2018 um, review shows all uh, options in medical treatment, and I'm not going to go into detail, but all these options have uh, one thing in common. They can temporarily regress uh, uh, the symptoms of adenomyosis and even uh, the diameter of the lesions. But the problem is, what do we know about fertility outcomes? The LNG IUD is a very used um, <clears throat> uh, medical treatment of adenomyosis. The classic dose, for example, Mirena or the low dose Kylina, um, are the classic uh, uh, LNG IUDs, and they can be used easily in adenomyosis in completed family planning. But they can also be used in young patients with uh, diagnosed adenomyosis, maybe with 22 years, with uh, ongoing uh, family planning, maybe six, seven years uh, in the future. So this might be a possibility to treat those patients until they wish to conceive. The LNG IUDs also can be used in the post-operative um, period uh, in both situations. Um, and they also are used by uh, some uh, colleagues before IVF. <clears throat> Dionogest is another option, and uh, this data shows that uh, Dionog Dionogest can reduce symptoms of adenomyosis. Uh, it's a very effective treatment also in adenomyosis, but uh, Dionogest can cause uterine bleedings, and these bleedings can be very heavy and they appear in a high percentage of treated patients. So uh, the bleeding at the end uh, causes a discontinuation of the treatment, and that's why maybe Dionogest is not the right medical tool for patients with um, diagnosed adenomyosis. The GnRH analogs can be used in the preoperative um, situation, for example, in large diffuse adenomyosis or in submucous adenomyosis, they can be used in the post-operative situation, three to six months, including the wound healing um, before pregnancy. Uh, they can also be used in some selected cases as in continuous treatment with a back substitution of estrogens and uh, gestogenes. And they also can be used, and I think this is very clear now, as a pretreatment um, before assisted uh, reproduction. There are some data. The problem is that there are no large uh, studies. There are no randomized trials, but uh, serious case reports. Uh, but for example, this publication shows that GnRH agonist long cycle protocols may improve pregnancy rates and decrease abortion rates. Um, <clears throat> this publication from 2016 shows higher 
pregnancy rates after pretreatment with GnRH analogs, and why we don't know. Maybe there's a time left for beta implantation. The question is for how long, and this is the question that we all always have to answer. How much time do I have to wait? Uh, how long will be the treatment? This is uh, difficult, and we do not have standards for that so far. Uh, here you can also see higher pregnancy rates after pretreatment, and <clears throat> That means that medical uh, treatment with GnRH analogs is of importance in adenomyosis and should be considered. What about surgery? Uh, is there an additional benefit of surgery in patients with adenomyosis? Uh, what is the right moment for surgery? Who is a possible patient for surgery? Um, interestingly, here in this uh, publication, you can see that the combination of sur surgery and medical treatment with GnRH analogs um, causes a higher pregnancy and birth rate. <clears throat> but there are also publications that show just the contrary results. For example, this publication, which is older, shows uh, the result that surgery alone is an important uh, tool uh, to treat adenomyosis and have a good uh, result. Um, in this uh, nice review from 2019, I think you can see that uh, the overall total rate, um, birth rate and pregnancy rate uh, in relation to all the possible surgical approaches in patients with um, adenomyosis and uh, fertility wishes. So the effects of surgical resection are always, in, in all the different uh, approaches, pain reduction, reduction of bleeding disorders, and uh, reduction uh, of CA12-5. But the problem is uh, that uh, adenomyosis surgery is not easy and it can cause a lot of problems, as we will see later, and it may cause uterine rupture after surgery during pregnancy, the uterine wall diameter minimum should be 9 to 15 millimeters. It may cause adhesions, uh, intra-abdominal or intrauterine adhesions, and it may cause irregular placentation. So <clears throat> Duholm states in her review from 2017 that uh, we have no controlled studies on surgical therapy of adenomyosis, there are no reliable diagnostic criteria so far, no clear message about the impact of adenomyosis in fertility, no correlation between severity of disease and outcome, no classification for severity of adenomyosis, and finally, surgery might be positive, but until now, no evidence-based situation. Well, that's right. Anyway, things are going on, and we are three years later. One very important publication is who will benefit from uterus sparing surgery in adenomyosis associated subfertility, uh, clinical pregnancy rate in correlation with age. And you can see very clearly that younger patients uh, less than 39 years uh, benefit more than older patients. And this is a kind of cutoff. So is there an additional benefit? Yes, in selected cases, which is the right moment for surgery? It should be before 39 years, I think even uh, much more early, uh, maybe before art or after art without success. And who will benefit uh, a patient with infertility in spite of reproductive treatments, uh, a patient with uh, symptoms, and maybe extreme cases as an ultimate ratio. So which are the possible approaches? I think um, <clears throat> just retro is possible when you send a very young patient to have spontaneous pregnancy, medication, then uh, reproductive treatment, yes, of course, with GnRH analogs. Uh, the triple of surgery, medication, and reproductive treatment can be a good idea too, and some su studies state that uh, even surgery and then reproduction could be a good idea. Which are the approaches? There are some approaches to save the uterus and some uh, approaches for completed planning, uh, family planning, uh, which um, contains hysterectomy and uh, other techniques.
Now, some uh, surgical um, examples. This is a large uh, cystic adenomyosis uh, with uh, severe pain um, in a patient uh, who uh, does not wish to conceive in the future. That's why we opted for hysteroscopic treatment. And uh, here you can see um, <clears throat> uh, the posterior wall, the bipolar resectoscope, and the opening of, uh, of the cystic lesion, which then is drained. And after draining it, <clears throat> then you can see that there's a kind of endometrial layer inside. Uh, and then we go inside and do an ablation of the uh, layer and uh, the patient is happy with this treatment and still mm, save the uterus. Of course, if, if this would be a case uh, uh, with a infertility case, then men should be with suture. Uh, here's another example. This is a diffuse adenomyosis of the uterine anterior wall, a uh, very large case. It's a patient uh, who wishes to conceive. Um, after some treatments, uh, the, the last option was surgery. We opted for open surgery or laparoscopic surgery. Uh, we did this case by laparoscopic site reduction and suturing. This looks like a fibroid, but uh, all this tissue is adenomyosis tissue and uh, uh, we do the cytoreduction and then the suturing. We use the monopolar needle. I remember when I discussed this with Jörg Kekstein, then he opted for cold knife resection. But of course, in these cases, uh, it would be great to have some studies too to show the benefits and results of different techniques. So this should be the status quo. It might be the status quo, I don't know. <clears throat> so far, the question is what is new in 2020? And I will just give you some, um, some examples, uh, a short overview of what I found in uh, PubMed uh, 2020 publications. Some are still warm. Um, and first we will talk about diagnostics. And here you can see that there are still some ongoing publications about uh, ultrasound signs. Uh, for example, <clears throat> here you can see uh, that uh, this group is focusing on myometrial contractions as a sign uh, of adenomyosis and uterine uh, anomalies. Um, here in these publications, uh, again, uh, the Italian group talks about the question mark sign, but in combination with the uterine tenderness as a good tool, but still uh, this does not mean that we have a standard or uh, a score for the diagnosis of the disease. And then we can find this um, review. Uh, it's one more review, I have to say, because uh, in 2018, 2019, there were a lot of reviews for adenomyosis, but unfortunately, no really new data. Um, the same thing uh, happens for classifications. We have some classifications, but uh, there's not the one classification. And here, for example, you can see uh, um, a new classification of adenomyosis, um, which is very interesting, uh, reviewing uh, possible classifications regarding all the different aspects. Um, and then here is a um, classification proposal by radiologists uh, done by MR Imaging. Um, and then, <clears throat> of course, we have uh, another um, proposal by Munro and his group. And he says there exists a need for harmonized classification systems for both ultrasound and MRI that agree with the histopathological features of the disease. And I think we can all agree with this and we should all work together, especially all the societies of, uh, uh, working on a proposal for classification system. Um, adenomyosis and malignancy. <clears throat> Here is an interesting case. Uterus, uh, 15 centimeters, 31-year-old woman, no pregnancies. The complete uterus is filled by 
um, endometrial tissue, as you can see. Um, in another hospital, they did some um, <clears throat> uh, hysteroscopy and abrasion. Uh, the result was no malignancy, but anyhow, there was rapid growth. So after taking a look at this uterus in this young uh, lady, we decided to do a hysterectomy, which was a strong decision. But what we found was at the end, uh, the proof that it was the right decision. As you can see here, this is the myometrium. This, all this is adenomyosis, and all this is an intraepithelial neoplasia uh, within the adenomyosis. So um, this uh, woman had a very high risk of <clears throat> um, developing um, endometrial cancer. And there are a lot of publications, and uh, I found three new publications, case reports, case series in 2020 about um, endometrial cancer rising from adenomyosis, uh, um, endometrial cancer uh, in uh, C-section scars arising from adenomyosis. So this is a topic that we have to pay a lot of in, uh, attention to. And there is one more interesting case report uh, about morselation for adenomyosis that shows uh, that uh, this can also cause disseminated endometriosis and low-grade stromal sarcoma. And I just will go through this uh, very fast, but it's a hot topic for me still because we all know that morselation has been more or less banned anyhow. It's, been, it's still used. Uh, we use uh, in-back morselation. I just want to show this to you. Uh, this is a sampling when you do not use a back and nobody can sample all these tissue fragments. Um, um, <clears throat> so what we know is uh, that uterine morselation causes peritoneal adenomyosis and peritoneal endometriosis. Uh, we also know that there is a risk of cancer from pre-existing endometriosis and that there's the rare malignant transformation of adenomyosis. And uh, we know the risk of unexpected malignant uterine tumors in subtotal hysterectomy. But what we don't know is uh, what is the rate of new onset endometriosis after morselation? What is the new, uh, what is the rate of new onset adenomyosis uh, after morselation? Nobody knows. This is one study which tries to explain, uh, but uh, from 360 patients, only eight underwent second look laparoscopy. So this data cannot be reliable in my eyes. So this is the typical finding, peritoneal and retroperitoneal adenomyosis after morselation. This is a case seven years after morselation, and this tissue can transform to pre-malignant or malignant lesions, uh, especially as it remains there for years, and it might be symptomatic or not. So that's why we use in-back morselation. Um, <clears throat> I think that's the better way. It's the clean way. And these are the rests after morselation. And it's always a good feeling when all this tissue and the liquid is in the back. Adenomyosis and fertility. <clears throat> There's one more review. Adenomyosis and infertility. Is there a causal link? I would say yes. But uh, the review is very interesting because it just summarizes all, all the... Uh, news from the last uh, two to three years um, and then there's one more uh, review uh, which says an abundance of studies but dearth of evidence and this is interesting because um, it's true that we have more and more data on adenomyosis but still things are not really changing because we have no evidence-based uh, um, standards so far. There is another uh, interesting publication about the junctional zone and the function and the importance of the junctional zone of the endometrium in human reproduction. Uh, this uh, article pays attention to the importance of the junctional zone and it shows why adenomyosis uh, has an impact on fertility as it disrupts the junctional zone, for example, as we can also see in ultrasound and MRI. And then 
uh, there are some people um, <clears throat> doing uh, hard facts too. Um, this is a group from China and they just uh, used HIFU versus laparos laparoscopic excision of adenomyosis, 50 patients versus 43. The reproductive outcome is better with HIFU. Both techniques are safe and effective, but HIFU is better. So maybe this is where things are developing. Um, I don't know. Another hot topic seems to be adenomyosis and adolescence. Um, <clears throat> as we know that adenomyosis has something to do with dysmenorrhea, uh, we pay attention more and more to the painful period in adolescent girls. Uh, the problem here is that there's a big lack of data-driven treatment guidelines, especially in these very young women or even girls. It's difficult to find a good uh, <clears throat> treatment approach as it's difficult to detect the adenomyosis. Maybe it's just symptomatic, but not visible yet in ultrasound. Uh, and what could be the treatment? Oral contraceptives, Dianogest, uh, a small LNG IUD, I don't know. And uh, especially in this group, we do not have data. Adenomyosis and obstetrics. Um, this is an interesting case because we have more and more cases of uh, patients who underwent surgery for adenomyosis and sometimes combination with fibroids. And as you can see in this video, um, this is a patient after the surgery and the endometrial layer uh, goes straight to the serosa. And this patient was sent to us before IVF treatment because uh, of fear that it might be ruptured when there's a pregnancy inside. So this was the initial situation <clears throat> uh, with some adhesions. And then here you can see that the posterior part of the uterus is open. Um, here you can see the small uh, opening to the cavity. And we try to do a resection of adenomyosis and reconstruction of the uterine wall. And uh, now the patient is trying to become pregnant. This was the final result. Now the uterus looks a little bit strange, as you can see. But anyway, this patient is going to have IVF treatment um, and hopefully everything will be fine. Of course, this is high risk surgery anyway. Uh, and here's another example, um, adenomyosis of the uh, C-section scar with scar pregnancies. and. Uh, <clears throat> This is another video, and then I'm almost finishing. Here you can see uh, that now we have a new problem, which is the increasing incidence of uterine niche due to C-sections combined with adenomyosis and adhesions. And this is just a small video uh, showing the treatment. This, this is a pregnancy of eight weeks. Uh, it's a scar pregnancy. And this is just the opening of the peritoneum. And by ultrasound, we know more or less where the scar and the pregnancies can be found. So this is just the opening by monopolar needle technique, which is a very uh, easy to use and safe and cost-effective method, especially in this kind of preparation. Of course, this is a surgery where you will have some bleeding as it is a pregnancy, ongoing pregnancy. <clears throat> we had uh, three or four cases last year in, in our hospital uh, in different weeks and some were really very difficult to treat. In one case, we even had to do hysterectomy, but um, it's interesting because in most of the cases, you can find adenomyosis in uh, this uterine scar. I will just continue a little bit because it's late already. Now you can see that the uterus is open. It's a very thin wall.
And this is the adenomyotic tissue, which is going out now. It's the scar in the adenomyotic tissue. There you can see the pregnancy now. And we take out the, the pregnancy and then the suturing and the final result. And then of course you can uh, check uh, the diameter of the anterior wall by ultrasound and usually it should be 10 to 15 millimeters. Um, just some points about the pathogenesis. <clears throat> There's a nice review by Google, uh, which is uh, just reviewing, reviewing uh, all, all the um, theories so far. Uh, and then I would like to um, show you um, the publication of Leyendecker from Germany, who is talking about evolutionary aspects in the pathogenesis of adenomyosis and endometriosis. He's calling this archimetrosis, um, and he's talking about the high contractility uterus as an evolutionary advantage um, uh, uh, in terms of giving birth and uh, postpartal uh, period. Uh, he's talking about that menstruation was a rare event in archetype times, and that nowadays as uh, menstrual and uh, hypercontraction is something that is not useful um, in this evolutionary way, uh, the tissue destruction can cause um, uh, adenomyosis. It's a very interesting paper and uh, maybe you can find time to read it. So there are some new insights in the pathogenesis too. And one last slide on surgical, um, innovations. Uh, here is another study from Asia which, which uh, compares microwave ablation and uh, radio frequency ablation for treating symptomatic uterine adenomyosis and the result is that both methods are safe and effective uh, and microwave ablation is a bit faster than uh, radio frequency ablation. Here you can see that there are some new things uh, upcoming uh, take home message, uh, think about adenomyosis in your patients with endometriosis. Adenomyosis can be diagnosed by the combination of clinical symptoms um, and ultrasound, if necessary, MRI and hysteroscopy. Symptoms can be reduced by medical and surgical treatment. Treatment can increase pregnancy and birth rates. Surgery in adenomyosis only in specialized centers as it is difficult and can have very adverse results. HIFU and RFI as upcoming procedures, maybe. Randomized trials are needed in general. We need to improve collaboration between societies working all together on consensus on classification, et cetera, et cetera. Some greetings from our team. Stay healthy, everybody. My best wishes to all the countries uh, who are listening now. It's really nice that we can be together here. And uh, I just would like to uh, make you pay attention to our next webinar, which is in May, uh, 19th of May, with our president, Engin Oral. Thank you so much. Edel, thank you so much for the comprehensive lecture, and uh, you are sharing us the, your experience about the adenomyosis. Actually, uh, do you have any question? For the adenomyosis. Yes, I have one question. Please. Hello, thank you very much for this explanatory and nice presentation. Uh, I would like to ask do you always prefer laparoscopic excision of scar pregnancies or sometimes do you prefer metatraxat? Um, yes, that's thank you for your. A very good question. Um, 
it, it depends on uh, um, uh, uh, pregnancy week. Uh, it depends on um, the idea how everything should go on. Uh, in this case, for example, we decided to do the resection because this patient wanted to become pregnant. And uh, I explained to her that we can uh, treat her, for example, by metotrexate, or we even could treat the pregnancy by hysteroscopy, but then uh, the uterine niche would remain. So we decided to do all in one surgery. But yes, you are right. In some cases, uh, we decide to do it first by hysteroscopy, and then in a second surgery, uh, we do the repair of the uterine niche. But in this video, we just com combined both things. Thank you. Um, Engin, can I ask a question, please? Please, please. Uh, hello, Harold. Um, um, Harold, they, uh, I was interested in uh, your uh, hysteroscopic resection biopsy for the diagnosis of adenomyosis. Um, can you please tell us on what situations, what circumstances uh, you decide to take a biopsy, hysteroscopically to confirm diagnosis, and how you use that information to, uh, for the management of the patient? So I'm just trying to think, um, you know, when we should really be taking a biopsy, apart from the concern about the malignancy. And we obviously also need to consider the potential uh, of creating intrauterine adhesions, especially in young women if they are planning to have more children when we decide to take a biopsy. So it's just a matter of weighing potential benefits and risks. If you can enlighten us on that, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Atan, for this very good question. Um, um, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's it's an invasive procedure, and in it it should be thought carefully if if you do it or not. Um, we think that a biopsy can be helpful, um, for example, in patients with uh, persistent pain, where in ultrasound I can see uh, microcysts or I have some hints on adenomyosis, but I'm not sure. So. I try to take a biopsy just in that area, which uh, uh, seems to be uh, pathologic um, in combination with the ultrasound. And in these cases, then I might have uh, a histological proof and uh, thus a possibility, um, for example, to go for LNG IUD even in younger patients. Um, this, this might be one reason. Um, Another reason might be a patient uh, who maybe should um, go for GnRH treatment before reproduction with uh, so far frustrating results. And it might be uh, helpful in this way to, um, to consider uh, um, a treatment like GnRH analogs. And in terms of adhesions, I think um, as we use the mini resectoscope, which is really very thin uh, and, and we just enter by uh, without any dilatation, without measuring uh, the length of the cavity. Um, you enter to the native, um, native cavity and then you just take these very small biopsies which are like, I don't know, three to four to five millimeters. I think there's a very, very low risk of uh, adhesion uh, formation. Uh, Harold, hi, this is Taner Usta. I would like to ask another question about the same topic. When you apply the hysteroscopy for a cystic adenomyosis, uh, which is inside the uterine wall, when you cut that lesions, you leave behind the, some cavity behind. Do you think that we can face uh, some problem in the future? <clears throat> Well, uh, in that case, with a very large cystic lesion, of course, this is the treatment in patients who do not want to conceive in the future. And uh, in young patients, the lesions usually are very, very small. So as I uh, just said, um, the lesion of the, of the uterine wall is just some millimeters, and I think usually it will be covered again. But of course, you are right. Uh, there are some cases uh, even without hysteroscopic biopsy uh, of uh, intramural uh, pregnancies after IVF treatment in adenomyosis, 
because sometimes you even uh, just have these micro tunnels from the, uh, uh, the superficial layer to the myometrial layer uh, and sometimes the, the, the uh, embryo just uh, finds uh, the place of nidation in there. So yes, this can be a problem, but uh, fortunately it never appeared so far. Thank you. Do we have another question? Um, yeah. well, I'm sorry, uh, Professor Oral. My second question is diagnosis. The most difficult part at the first start is diagnosis. Um, sometimes when we see a patient, but this is not a complete adenomyosis, some lesions inside the uterus, but when you check the patient next month, you lose that signs of adenomyosis. And when you solve that uh, signs of lesions, uh, I think that can we need uh, one more examination about diagnosis? Because if the patient haven't got a, some uh, clear lesions, some clear signs, it's very easy to diagnose this. But if the patient haven't got a strong evidence of adenomyosis, we can miss the adenomyosis. What do you think about that one? Yes, you are absolutely right. Um, some, sometimes we think that it's for sure adenomyosis and then it's not. Uh, this experience with, uh, for example, hysterectomies that we perform in patients with uh, um, uh, adenomyosis or we think that it might be adenomyosis and then at the end it is not. So this can be, can be a problem and uh, uh, for me, the ultrasound is just a tool that gives me a certain probability, but you can never be sure. Of, of course, for example, uh, when you ask uh, Katarina Exacustus, she, she, she will tell you that with ultrasound in combination with 3D, you can be very sure. But yes, she's excellent and uh, not all of us uh, can uh, use the ultrasound in, in such a perfect manner. Uh, it's not that easy and that's why I think that sometimes uh, a biopsy can be um, a good procedure. Um, also uh, also in, uh, in, in, in laparoscopy. But the problem is that uh, the taking, uh, ob obtaining of a biopsy is a very uh, severe problem and we do not have a good solution for that. So even especially in, in very young patients, it's very difficult to find a clear diagnosis. You're, you're right, Tana. Yeah. Harold, uh, we have the question from the, uh, uh, from the chat panel, and this is from Ellie from the Bulgaria. She is asking about the, when you use the LNG IUD treatment before ART, ART and how long? Um, I mean, before the ART, you want to use the uh, Mirana, can you use it or how long? Maybe I can give uh, this question to you, Angin, as you are <laughs> an expert in fertility. Actually, uh, uh, hi. You know, we have just one publication from the Asia. It says it's useful. At least you have to use three or six months before the uh, ART. It looks like promising, but we don't know. It has to be confirmed in our practice, actually I just started, I have just two cases, that's why I don't know what is the result of this one, but we need to, another publication to be sure it's effective or not before the ART for the adenomyosis, especially for the diffuse one. Any question from the audience? Yes, I have some. Please. Can you hear me, yeah? Okay. So. Um, I have a question about um, the Japan techniques of the surgery. So I saw a lot of surgeries in your presentation. Thank you for that. So the question is that you know that almost 90% of all surgeries, I mean, cytoreductive, is made in Japan. Do you have the explanation for that? This is the first question. The second question, they have a, the pregnancy rate like 22-21% and take-home take baby rate for 80%. So do you have uh, any explanation again for such a high take-home baby rate? Uh, because, uh, you know, we have such 
patients, but unfortunately we have a lot of miscarriages um, during the pregnancy. So maybe there are special uh, prescriptions uh, for such patients uh, during pregnancy. Thank you. Um, thank you for this uh, very good question. It's very difficult to answer. Um, yes, you're right. Uh, many publications are from the Asian countries and um, I don't know exactly why, but uh, it, it's just like you say, when uh, you look for adenomyosis, uh, most of the new publications are from Asian countries. And uh, I think you've been talking about the Ozara technique, which is also done by colleagues here in Europe, by Jörg Eckstein, uh, by Radek Schwatal. And we sometimes uh, use this technique too. Uh, but of course, uh, it's a technique which uh, you should use as an ultima ratio when there, all, all the rest of uh, the therapies is not working. It's an open procedure. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, not so easy to do and the results can be good and, and can be bad. The data from Ozara, for example, is quite good too, as you mentioned. Um, and I don't know exactly uh, what is the difference between their technique and your technique, but uh, the problem that we still have is that there are no randomized trials, and uh, as long as we do not have these trials, we, we cannot have an evidence-based uh, standard. Um, that's what I can say, answering your question. Another problem for this uh, question, I, for the answer to this question, these publications are coming from the Asia. They are not approved from the uh, west part of the world. Uh, all of them from the Asia, from the Japan, Chinese, and Thailand, and other ones. We have to approve and we have to confirm these publications because as you said, most of them, they have got really, really high pregnancy rate. I mean, take home baby rate. As we know, these are the not acceptable figures actually in our practice. Really high. We don't know these are the focal adenomyosis or diffuse one. This is very, very different. Do we have another comment or question? Um, uh, maybe, please. Uh, Harold, hi. Taner again. Uh, yes. What do you think about the diffuse adenomyosis in a young single woman? You know that um, medical treatment is not effective in this woman. Uh, is there any place of uh, surgery in this woman? For example, 35 years old or 38 years old young woman and diffuse adenomyosis, but she is single. Uh, do you recommend him uh, uterine um, preserving surgery? Um, so this patient uh, still uh, wishes to conceive? No, single woman, unmarried Sorry? woman. This is single woman, unmarried woman, but yes, normal but... this lady is, has got a pain and at the same time uterine building problem. Yes. Uh, when you offer her to medical treatment, Mirena or medical treatment, the answer is all of us know there is not enough uh, answer about the medical treatment. What do you think about uh, uh, uterine preserving surgery? Do you recommend for uterine preserving surgery or uh, you wait and you can apply the GnRH analog? What do you think about? That's no, you, you, I, I was wondering because you said young single lady of 35 or 38 years old. <laughs> no, yeah. She, she's yeah. not that. There's a lot of lady walking around. Yes, um, well, it's, it, that's a problem. I mean, as, as but we, nowadays, as we know currently from they are young. the data, the age is a problem. And uh, I, I, in this case, I would not recommend surgery. I, I would go for medical treatment, maybe LNG, IOD. Uh, if, if, if she uh, has a partner, she, she wishes, wishes to conceive, then uh, I would directly uh, send her to a uh, repro center without surgery. After the medical treatment, when you see the uh, fail, 
what would you recommend her? Well, if, if the medical treatment fails and uh, she wishes to stay with the uterus, of course, then it's possible to do a surgery, yes. The, the, because we know that the surgical resection of the adenomyosis will uh, decrease the pain by, by uh, a certain rate. But of course, it will help her. Do we have another comment or question from the audience? I mean, especially for the young ones? Uh, um, I'm in, yeah. yeah. Please. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So um, to sum up, um, I would like to ask, um, what, what do you think? Uh, so we need first a nice classification, a nice ultrasound classification, and third, the prospective randomized trial. Am I right? So to understand the pathology and to make uh, some agreement. It would be it would be nice to have all these classifications, but uh, I think so far in the last two or three years uh, we had a very good uh, development in uh, diagnosis of adenomyosis uh, and treatment options, um, and it's really moving forward. And I'm very optimistic. And we are doing treatments of a lot of patients with adenomyosis in our hospital, <clears throat> and. Uh, that's why I think, yes, we, we should work on classification, on, on more uh, evidence-based methods, but yes, we also have some tools in our hands and we can help uh, patients with adenomyosis. And I think the take-home message is, at the end, that when you treat patients with endometriosis or for infertility reasons, you just should consider adenomyosis as a possible um, uh, cause. Uh, by the way, I would like to thank the, our young team, especially our uh, administrative secretary Francisca and the, uh, her helper N Nadia. Thank you so much for the EAL, EAL uh, webinar uh, technical support. And uh, our young team, we have a young team. If you want to uh, join us, it will be very happy. You can find the uh, uh, rules uh, in our website. Please follow our website and our social media platform. Uh, we are working on it. Uh, you can follow the Twitter and LinkedIn and uh, Facebook and other ones. Uh, thank you for our young uh, core team for the AL uh, working. And uh, Harold, as I understand from your uh, slides, we have two important things we have to focus on it, except fertility. First, cancer and the second one, adenomyosis in adolescent. What do you think? Yes, I, I think that's right. Um, uh, I think the uh, possible malignant transformation is, is a very important topic um, as uh, adenomyosis is, uh, has a quite high incidence. Um, this might be relevant in the future. And uh, as we understand now, maybe also by new pathogenesis uh, publications like uh, this one from uh, Guo or Leyendecker, uh, the adenomyosis might start very early in adolescence and it might be interesting to focus on this group. Uh, even I think it's very difficult to find out details, but uh, there are some publications too, for example, by our colleague uh, Sylvia Maxner from Charité Hospital in Berlin. Um, and yes, I think this might be a, a good uh, work for the future. And if we understand early adenomyosis, then uh, we might be better in improving the uh, situation uh, in terms of fertility. Thank you, Harold. Actually, we are just now 65 minutes uh, from the beginning. Thank you so much for the audience from all over the world, especially from the uh, South America and the uh, Europe and the rest of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you for the lecture. The next lecture will be 19th of May. Uh, it's given by me. Uh, the topic will be, as Harold said, yeah, what is the current management in the advanced endometriosis and infertility? Thank you so much. Uh, good night. Thank you. Good night.